Good morning. Welcome again to VFC. Thanks for being here this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, hey, before I jump into today, I want to talk about next week. Next week's really a fun week for us. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, so we always have Super Bowl Sunday is always our third highest attended Sunday of the year. It's our second. Um, I, don't, I guess second highest salvation number of, of the year every every single year. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And here's why. Here's why. Here's why. Because uh, well, football players. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who's coming to uh, to Norman ne- next week. I know. Uh, I think Reggie Grimes and Ethan Downs will be at one of our campuses, but I don't think they're here. I'm not sure. Uh, I think here Tressway, who is the punter, pro bowler for the uh, Washington Commanders, uh, what sounds like an arena football team, but it's not. It's the NFL, uh, the Washington Commanders. Um, Marvin Mims, I think, will be here, and then Jeremiah Cradell uh, will be here as well. And, uh, and Jeremiah, he, he got a really cool story. Uh, if you follow him on social media, he just retired from football. And we'll talk about, he's got two years left of eligibility, we'll talk about why uh, he retired, what he's doing now. So it'll be really, really cool uh, next week. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. Now, bring somebody that doesn't know the Lord. Okay, bring somebody that doesn't know the Lord. Every single year when we do this, people that do not love Jesus but love OU football, they come. And they give their lives to the Lord, and they become a part of the church family, and they get discipled, and they and they grow in God. So this is next Sunday. It's just really a Sunday to introduce people to Jesus. Okay, so please bring somebody that doesn't know the Lord. It'll be an awesome, awesome week. And, and just just in case uh, you d- you were thinking about coming to the ten o'clock next week, don't. Um, we literally had to turn people away at the 10 o'clock today because it was not enough seating, and so don't come to the 10. If you want to come to the 1 o'clock, that's great, too, because every one of them will be packed next week. Yeah, you're clapping, but you're here, so it's weird. <laughs> We're at this one. So, so in, in this series in, in Habits, we talked about how to remove bad habits. So we talked about in order to, to, to begin something new, you first have to cut away. And so if something is dead, if something is not healthy, you want to cut it away so you can begin new habits. So we talked about uh, then developing a habit of fasting, of praying, of reading God's word. Last week, Pastor TJ, awesome word on developing the habit of biblical community. And today I want to talk about how to develop the habit of generosity. And generosity is really tricky for, for any pastor, right? Because as soon as you start talking about giving, generosity, tithe, anything like that, there's a, a certain section of people that are always going to go, here we go again. This is what, because you guys know the church just wants your, I was going to say heart, so that's kind of, that's offensive that you guys said money. That's weird. Um, <laughs> But it's true. Like, like there's, there's a lot. There's a, a perception that the church just wants your, your money. And I'll be honest. If you're skeptical, I think it's great to be skeptical. It's okay to be skeptical. I'll tell, I'll tell you in a second. You can get our, our, our budget. You should be skeptical because a lot of churches have done a lot of really dumb stuff with money. They've, they've misused and abused finances. Not just churches, but nonprofits. Not just recently. Not just for decades, but for centuries. So it's okay to be skeptical. I, I, I get it. So here's what I'm, I'm, anytime I talk about money or giving or generosity, and today's not just about finance, it's also about time and, and gifts. But I, I have to give a lot of disclaimers, so I'm going to give you a few disclaimers. One, we're very blessed as a church. We don't need anything from you. We're not trying to manipulate you, and I believe this with everything in me. This is not preacher talk. Uh, this is not even a face that, like, this is just, I just believe this. Whatever the Lord calls this church to do, he will figure out a way to provide for it, period. It is his church. It is his body. It is his house. And, and anything that he's ever called us to do, it, sometimes we're like, I don't know how we're going to do this. And then, boom, he does something absolutely crazy. So, so, so we don't depend on people. We depend on the Lord. That's it. He sends us great people. We, we depend on God. And God does his thing. Also, we're big, huge on financial transparency here. And so, like, we'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you I'll, every, everything you want to know. You want to know how much money's in the bank? Ask me. You want to know how much debt we have? Ask me. I, I, I give you the whole budget. If you want the budget, actually, you can have the budget. Email us, accounting at vfc.church. Email accounting at vfc.church, and they will email you about If you're new and you've never given and you just want to know, I wonder how they spend their money. Accounting at vfc.church. Now give us several days because of a thousand people email. It may take a little bit of time for our team to get back with you because they're pretty busy. But accounting at vfc.church. And you say, with $8 million, what do you spend all that money on? That's a great question. Uh, if you weren't here two weeks ago, uh, watch that video, and you'll know what, that's what we spend our money on. Uh, we, we were able to give away three-quarters of a million dollars to, uh, to missions. We saw over uh, 
2,000 people give their lives to Jesus. We have a healthy kids ministry, a healthy youth ministry, healthy outreach, healthy healthy small groups. Man, I believe if you, when you look at the budget, you, I think you'll think, man, they're a great steward of the finances that the Lord has entrusted them to. And so I want you to know this. I'm not preaching this to get more out of you. I promise you, I'm preaching this so God can do more through you. Last year, we also had over 2,000 people that volunteered at one of our campuses or at an outreach. There's about 400 people that volunteer every single week. Now, do we always need more volunteers? Yes. Can we survive without more volunteers? Absolutely, we can. But again, it's not about what we want from you. It's about what we want for you. Okay? Jesus talks about giving more than any other topic in Scripture. Why? Because it... How we spend our finances and our time reveal the condition of our heart. There's several key words that you see in Scripture. The word believe is in there 272 times. The word pray is in there 371 times. The word love is in there 714 times. The word give is in Scripture 2,162 times. Jesus taught 38 parables, 16 of them were about finances. There's 500 verses on prayer, 700 verses on faith. There's 2,000 verses on money. It's almost 1 in 10. Think about it. Why would God spend so much time in Scripture on finances? Because he understands the stranglehold that it has on our lives. He understands that it becomes an idol for many, if not most, people. He also understands it would be a contributing factor to divorce and the number one stressor in most people's lives. He knows that we're tempted to base our life decisions on finances and time more so than his word and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 6. I'm reading tons of scripture today. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But, but you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and in offerings. You are under curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Now God's tone in this passage is not as condemning as it, it, may, it may seem. He, he's not talking about how bad it is for him. He's not up in heaven like all of a sudden now I'm worried, like I'm not going to be able to pave the streets of heaven in gold. We may have to shift to silver. Like I don't know what to do up here. He's not nervous. Okay? It's a corrective verse to help them not live under a curse. It's a verse about, about his love and compassion that he has on their life. Verse 10 goes on to say, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, some people say I tithe 5%. Okay, the word tithe actually means 10%. And so if you say I tithe 5%, that's like saying I 10% 5%. <laughs> it, it, that doesn't make sense, okay? Storehouse is talking about the church. Bring the whole 10% into the church that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Okay, this is cool too. Only time in scripture, only time in scripture that the Lord says test him is with your finances. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. The, the Lord wants to bless you. He's saying, I want to do something incredible in your life, but you've handcuffed me. Take the handcuffs off and let me do what I want to do in your life. Then verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is the heart of this passage, to open us up to receive a blessing from God. Now, I want to be really clear. We never give to get. That's not the heart of giving. That's not the heart of generosity. God is not a genie in a bottle. He's not a vending machine where if you just figure out a code, then all of a sudden you get what you want. It's not like when the offering bucket passed, you put a dollar in, you're like, big money, big money, big money, big money. Come on, come on, come on. You keep checking your bank account, seeing if something just happened. Come on, come on. That's not it. That's not it. I'm, I'm, I'm anti-prosperity gospel. Now, I, mean, I don't know where Miss Dooney is. Uh, me and all day, we disagree on prosperity gospel because we, we talk about it differently. When I think prosperity gospel, I think about people that put uh, Rolls Royce on the refrigerator and just walk by, walk by and name it so they can claim it or whatever every single day. That ain't in the Bible. 
okay? And if the gospel doesn't work in Haiti, it doesn't work here, okay? Scripture's got to be the same everywhere. And so it won't work there, then it won't work there. It's not, but, but here's how Ade believes in prosperity gospel. He believes that the prosperity means that the Lord will meet all your needs. Well, the Bible says that. So Nigerian prosperity gospel, I'm into it. American prosperity gospel, I think it's garbage, okay? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> but here's the thing. There is a biblical principle of reaping and sowing. When you give, the Lord always blesses you. I don't, I don't give so I can give. That's not the heart of generosity. But at the same time, when I do give, the Lord always blesses me. I know some of you, you look at the Malachi verse and you think, that's Old Testament? Like, that's, that doesn't apply anymore. Jesus came. He changed all that stuff. I'm glad you brought that point up. Let me go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Anytime Jesus is mad, he says, woe to you. Like, I don't know, like... Like, I don't know what you say to your kids when you're angry to get their attention. Uh, sometimes I just say yo real loudly. Yo! But uh, Jesus doesn't say yo. He says, woe to you. Teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So let me be really clear. Are there more important things than tithing? Yes. Yes, there are. Like justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Why do I believe that? Because that's what the Bible says, right? So... But, but he says this, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. What he's saying is there are certainly more important things than the tithe, but don't stop tithing. You should continue tithing. It's not and or, it's and both. And then, and then some of you that you, you think, well, the, that 10%, that's an Old Testament thing. Let's, just, let's be like the Church of Acts then. They sold everything to give to anyone that was in need. So, so you're a New Testament believer? That's great. That's great. Let's just sell everything. You sell everything and give to, to, to anybody that has a need. Now you want to go back to the Old Testament, right? You're like, that's easier for me. Let's just go do that, that, that. I like that, all right? And it's important we understand generosity is not just about finance. It's about your, your, your time. It's about your gift set. Romans 12, 6 says this. It says, we have different gifts According to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What does that mean? Every gift that we have from the Lord is a blessing from God given to us that we are to hold open hand and to say, this is not my own, but this is yours. It, whatever gift that God has given you, whatever talent God has given you, you understand it is from him to be used generously for him. That's why he gives. Blessed to be a blessing. Most famous verse in all of scripture is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, what? He gave. God's response to a lost and broken world was bankrupting heaven so you could be free, so you could have eternity, so you could have life. And then Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, he, Jesus is saying, I didn't come to be like a normal king that you guys are used to, that everybody serves me. I came actually to serve you and to give my life. See, the, the theme, one of the themes throughout the entirety of Scripture is a life of generosity. So I'm going to give you three things real quick, three reasons why developing a habit of generosity will change your life. Number one, generosity connects us to the heart of God. I'm going to read another large chunk of Scripture in Matthew chapter 25. Usually when I preach stuff that I think people are going to have a problem with, I just, I just read like three times as much scripture. So. <laughs> so you can argue with God. Makes it better than arguing with me. Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the, on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
This is, this is where the verse gets crazy. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, like, that's intense. Depart from me, you're cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then he goes on to say, when I was sick, you gave me nothing. When I was clothed, when I was naked, nothing. When I was hungry, nothing. Prison, nothing. And they were like, Lord, we didn't even see you. He said, whatever you've done or haven't done unto the least of these, then you haven't done to me. And, and this passage seems so intense. And it almost seems as if our entrance into heaven is based on works. It almost seems like he's separating based on those of you that did things when I was generous versus those of you that did things when I wasn't generous. It, 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 it seems a little, bit, a little bit crazy, but we know that we're not saved by works. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any less or any more because he already sent his son down across you. He already has proven his love for you. We also know that you are only saved, only saved by grace through your faith in Jesus. The only way you're saved is by grace through your faith in Jesus. We, we repent. We return from our sin, stop living life our way, and start living life God's way. So why does this passage say that? It reaffirms that faith without works is dead. What Jesus is separating is those that say they have faith versus those that actually do have faith. Those that say that they follow Jesus versus those that actually do follow Jesus. And I hate that I'm about to say this statement in a, in a sermon that I'm talking about finances because this is not trying to get more out of you. I promise you that. And so I say that. I'm not trying to manipulate you. I, this is just my fear, and it has been, and my, uh, our staff knows this. Here's my fear because the church, is, it, it continues to grow. And... As the church has gotten big, my greatest fear as a pastor, and this has nothing to do with this message today, okay? It, just, it does have to do with this passage. Is that we may have a, a large percentage of the church that are actually false converts. They said a prayer and they think that they're okay, but they've never repented, they've never lived for God, and their life looks nothing like his. And they just show up at church once in a while to alleviate the guilt in their life or because they're trying to punch a time clock because they think if I said a prayer and I show up at church a couple times a month, then that means that I'm good. But, but following Jesus is actually about following Jesus. If Christy and I will we'll celebrate 20 years of marriage, uh, yeah, we just didn't really do anything, just didn't stop. Um, <laughs> uh, this summer will be 20, right? But if I were to tell you, if I were to tell you, hey, we got married 20 years ago, and we said these vows to each other. We were in her church, and, and we, a couple of pastors there, and we said all these vows, and everybody prayed over us. Then we went on our honeymoon, and went to Mexico, and we had an absolute blast. And then we got back, and I said, I said, yo, that was fun. I'll see you, and maybe, you wanna, maybe we'll get together again in a few weeks or a couple months, whatever. Like, you go do your thing, I'll go do my thing. And I was like, you better get a good job because you ain't ever touched anything that I make. I'm just saying, you get a, which for the first decade of our marriage, she made way more than me. So, and now I'm her boss, so I can't let her make more than me, you know? I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. She made a lot more than me early on. What if I was just to say, like, like, I got my stuff, you got your stuff. This is separate. I'm gonna, look, I'm going to go stay on my own house. You get your own house. I'm going to do my thing. Actually, there's a couple girls that I, I kind of like talking to, so I'm going to keep talking to them. It's cool. And we were together. I didn't treat her right. I was just like, whatever. You would say, one, you're an idiot and you're a jerk, right? And you should. And somebody should punch me in the face, right? But two, you would say, why did you say all those vows? You didn't mean a word of it. You don't actually love her. And it makes a lot, like, when I say that about marriage, you're like, well, of course, of course. But yet, isn't that how we are in our faith a lot? What we, what we say and what we do 
seem to be pretty far ends of the of the spectrum. We can't claim that we love God if we don't live for him, if our actions never follow it. Did Jesus say, whatever you've done on the least of these, you've done unto to, to me. When you give of your finances, and we'll talk about giving to other churches later, so just I want to make that clear. When you give of your finances here, you're helping single moms. You're putting Bibles in the hands of Iranians. You're, you're drilling water wells in Liberia, Africa for people that don't have water. You're building homes in Haiti. You're helping women that have been rescued from ISIS. You're supporting addiction recovery, homelessness, and foster care in our own community. You're a part of every salvation that, that, that God did. Not I did. God did. Not you did. God did last year. But we're part of it. We're part of it. He uses us. Whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done unto Jesus. And then it says, John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you're my disciple if you love one another. So a lot of people think, like, what's the mark of a church with great discipleship? How many programs do you have? How many Bible studies do you have? How many? Blah, blah, blah. You know what the mark of a church of great disciples during a pandemic and political unrest and racial unrest, a group of people that don't tear each other apart like you did? I would tell you, I would tell you, people ask me, your church full of disciples? Man, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping so, but the ones that I'm friends with on Facebook, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. They seem to be mean to each other. I don't care how much scripture you can quote. It's cool. The people that Jesus separated, he, they probably quote some scripture too. How much do you actually live? How do you love people? Should we have, do we have programming? Yeah, we have programming. Do we want our kids and teenagers to know the Lord and grow in the Lord? Yeah, absolutely. We have small groups so you can grow in the Lord? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But you're not known to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus by attending something. It's by loving people. When you give your time, when you serve in God's house, when you serve God's people, when you're mentoring students that don't have fathers, when you're changing diapers, when you're praying for people, when you're loving people, when you're serving people, all of that connects you to the heart of God. And listen, our church, I want to be super clear, it's not the only avenue. There's a lot of avenues, but you need to find yours. If you're following Jesus, you should be living a life of generosity. Generosity connects you to the heart of God. Generosity also teaches us to trust God. Matthew 6, 31 says, do not worry Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after those things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then these things will be given to you as well. It doesn't say you don't ever get those things. It says just seek God first. Put God first, and then he'll take care of you. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In 2014, and I hate, I hate sharing this because I hope it doesn't come across weird, but I'm, I'm going to, and I have a couple of times, and I always feel weird, but just, I hope it's okay. It's my fifth time today, so, and I always hate it. Uh, in 2014, I felt like the Lord asked us to give all of our money away. So at that time, Christy and I, in our savings account, had probably $2,000. In our checking account, we had like $12.47. I'm not kidding. And then, and then, but we had, we, had, we had slowly put money away in a, a Roth IRA uh, since the day we were married. And so we had about $40,000, I think, right? 40, about $40,000 in our Roth IRA. And so, um, so I went to Christine and I said, hey, I want you to pray about this. And she was like, I don't need to, let's do it. I'm like, can you please pray about it? Maybe you can talk me out of it. Maybe, you, maybe the Lord will tell you something different, you know? She said, no, I don't need to. I love it. Let's, let's, let's do it. I said, okay. So, so we cashed all that out, paid our penalties, and got every dime that we had. And and wrote one check to the church in 2014. And, uh, and I remember that Sunday driving home, I thought, man, what if our transmission goes out? What if something happens at the house? What if? And so like there's this fear that really starts just kind of, and I'm, my, my, my kids are a little bitty at the time. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? What if something happens? And, and then there's just an overwhelming sense of peace came over me. And for the first time in my life, I felt like, wait a second, this is the first time in my life I'm actually depending on the Lord. 
this is the first time in my life that, like, I, like I, I, need, I need God. Like, I need him to show up. And there's this overwhelming sense of, of, of peace and, like, this sense of joy. And, and then you used to get excited. Man, what's God going to do? I had read Robert Morris's book, The Blessed Life. Y'all read The Blessed Life? Right? So, like, The Blessed Life, like, Robert tries to, uh, I should say Pastor, Pastor Robert, he, he, like, tries to outgive God. He talks about how you can never outgive God. So he, like, tries. I'm going to outgive God. I'm going to see if I can outgive God. He goes on this, like, life experiment, and he, he starts giving stuff away, and then God blesses him, then he gives a car away, and God blesses him. Then he gives, like, so he talks about how he's giving all the stuff away, and so finally he gives his really, like, nice house away. And he's giving all the furniture away in the house, and he's giving the house away, and he's sitting on, like, a crate in his living room of his house, and he says, finally, like, there's just and he wasn't like doubting God. He just said, this is it. Like, I don't think God's going to give me any more than what the value of this house is. And he said, as he's sitting on this crate, he gets a phone call and somebody gives him a private jet. And so like, I've read that book and I'm like, we're pretty close to Westheimer. I mean, like, <laughs> I couldn't afford the gas in it, but you know, I mean, it'd be cool to go look at, you know, it's my jet. <laughs> stupid but nothing like that happened for me I think somebody bought me a Subway sandwich and that was cool um, but there wasn't some big thing until about six months later uh, I was talking to uh, the Green family that owns Hobby Lobby and in this building it looked a lot different it was a lot, there was no balcony and there was no lobby and just this this part of the building and one wing over there and uh, it was worth about $5 million, and Hobby Lobby bought it for $3 million and then and then gave it to us. Not not me, but the, the church. And we were in Jiffy Lube. I was getting my, I was getting my oil changed in my car, and just imagine me and Jiffy Lube just bawling, you know? They're like, sir, are you okay? I'm like, the Lord is good. It's all fine. It's good. Just change, give me my, you know, just change my oil, sir, please. Leave me alone. And... Uh, and I just feel like, like I was praying and, and obviously so overwhelmed and so grateful. And I feel like the, the Lord brought us giving back. I'm not saying because I gave, the Lord gave me this. What I am saying is I didn't realize all that God was going to do in this church. I didn't realize just a few short late years later we'd have five, 6,000 people and four campuses. And, and I don't say that to be cool. I'm just saying I didn't know. I didn't know. But I feel like the Lord was trying to make sure that I would trust him. And no matter, I think, because he, he obviously knew he just wanted to make sure that we would be a church that would always live open-handed. I could always just say, it's not mine, God, it's yours, and whatever you want. He needed to be able to trust. It's a lesson I learned when I was my son's age. Now, my, my son and my daughter, they, they live a very blessed life. And, and when I was that age, I, I didn't realize we were poor. Um, and I think, I hope my mom's not watching. She gets mad at me when I say that. Um, but we, we lived in a house that cost $67,000. Um, and my dad was an old guy. My mom worked at the school, and and we put the house up for sale. I say we like I had anything to do with the house. Like they put the house up for sale because they couldn't afford it. We had ten dollars a, a week entertainment budget, what they called it. But that was like if we wanted McDonald's, that was half of. I mean, that was or that was all of it, right? So that was that was it. And and my dad, he'd always he'd always taught us to give ten percent, and and and, and he had always given. He's always always always. Tithe, right? I remember even as a kid when I was riding lawnmower broke, we had almost an acre of riding lawnmower broke. We couldn't afford to fix it. And so and so he just he he, he put a line in the in the yard and said, Adam, and it wasn't just a nor it wasn't a self-propelled push mower, spoiled kids today. It was a mulching, it's a mulching guy that didn't know self-propellant. It's I was the propellant, like so I'm, and so Adam does half acre, Greg does half acre, and my allowance was three dollars and twenty-five cents. And I had a whole bunch of other crap around that house too. And, and they made me pay tithe off that $3.25. Plus, plus they made me give an offering. So, And so when they didn't have anything, my dad stopped giving 10% and he started giving 12%. And you know, when he passed away a year and a half ago, he left my mom in a place where she'll never have to think about money again in, in her life. The Lord just began to bless them. And it wasn't right away, it wasn't immediate, it wasn't a genie in a bottle, and my dad never in a million years dreamed what he would have had before he passed away. He wasn't doing it for that. He was just trying to be faithful 
to the Lord. And he did tell me, he said, I, don't, I, read, I read the Bible and it said test him, so I was just trying to test him. I was just, I was just telling him, like, I clearly can't figure this out, so you got to help me. And he did. I learned how to trust the God. A lot, a lot of people say, I can't afford to tithe. I would just argue you can't not afford because God will do so much more with your 90% than you could ever dream of doing with 100%. And generosity, I'll close with this statement. Generosity makes us more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. This series, we're talking about habits have us to make us more like Jesus. Like when you dig into God's word, man, you're going to learn more about him, so you're going to become more like him. When you pray, you're going to connect with his heart. You're going to be more like him. When you fast, you're more like him. And when you become generous, you become more like Jesus. Generosity is about sacrificially giving of ourselves for the kingdom of God and the sake of others. It's saying, I have something that I can give that will help somebody else. How many of y'all remember in, in, in school, square pizza and corn day? Come on. You know what I learned earlier today? I learned earlier today, Putnam City North, where my wife went. They had cinnamon roll day. Yeah, a bunch of rich, spoiled. It wasn't cinnamon roll day. But it was cinnamon rolls for lunch. First of all, it's not healthy. Second of all, phew. Like, I'm sure you're private school. You guys got fresh squeezed orange juice every day. I'm sure you yeah. We didn't have none of that stuff. We didn't have none of that stuff. We were a Mustang. We were, and there was, everything was okay. Everything was okay. Except for Salisbury Steak Day. Y'all remember that stuff? Yeah, that look you have on your face. It's the look that everybody has when you walk in the cafeteria. It's, oh, it just like, it permeates through the building. Oh, it's disgusting. You sit at, like, the whole time you're in line, you're not sure what you're even supposed to do. Like, how much mashed potatoes can I put on top of it? You know, smother it in so I don't actually taste it, you know, and then you take a bite and you immediately get your chocolate milk down, you know, and it's gross. But then there was always one kid that the mom, she was so smart and so prepared. She packed a big old sack lunch, big old Lunchable, you know, and had the Jello pudding. <sighs> so good. The fruit roll-ups and the gushers. Y'all you still, you still have the gushers? Y'all? What y'all? They're not as good as they used to be? You think it's because you grew up or? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and he sit across from you and he open up his stuff and he just sees you in your absolute misery. And he says, do you want my gushers? Yes. <laughs> Guys, that's generosity. That's generosity. That's the heart of generosity, to say, I have something, and you have something terrible. <laughs> and I'm going to give what I have so you can experience what I'm experiencing. Generosity is not just, I don't know, that's a dumb illustration, but generosity is not just saying, I'm giving to feel good, I'm, I'm giving to put on a show, I'm, I'm giving to alleviate some sort of whatever. It's sacrificing so others can experience what you've experienced. I, like, I want to sacrifice so somebody else can have clean drinking water. I want to sacrifice so a kid can have a, a mentor. I want to sacrifice so somebody can have a house in a different country. I want to sacrifice. So people struggling with addiction in our community can become free. I want to sacrifice to help the foster families and adoptive families. It's giving what you have to help somebody else. There's no greater example of generosity than Jesus who came and gave his life for us so we could have joy and peace and eternal life. And generosity always starts by allowing the love and generosity of God to transform our hearts to make us more like him. We talked a lot about how to create a habit. For me, when it comes to giving, it's super simple. Everything's auto withdraw. Tithe, offering, auto withdraw. It comes out first and 15th. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big believer in the first fruits, so I want to give to God before I give the OG and E. I'm just telling you, like, oh, I give to God first. Come on, it's easy. We talk about if you want to, if you want to keep a habit, make it easy and be consistent. All right? That's what auto withdrawal does for me, easy and consistent. 
But if you want to give of your time, sign up to volunteer before you leave today. Well, I want to be super clear. We're doing fine. We always, always can need more volunteers. But we're fine without you. We'll be okay. Church is doing really well financially. I'm not trying to get a thing out of you. Here's what I would encourage you. And this is, I've tried to figure out how to say this without coming across condescending. And it's just not in me. So <laughs> I've tried. I'm telling you, Christy, I just don't know how. Listen, if you don't want to serve here or give here, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Go somewhere else. Not because I don't want you. What I would rather you do is I'd rather you serve here or give here. That's what I'd rather you do. But, but let, let me tell you why. I would rather you just find a place, a body of believers, that you would say, I want to be a part of it, and I want to be all in. And I, I don't say this in a sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek type of way at all. I say this with absolute sincerity. Like, there's a lot of really great churches in our community that are different flavor for everybody. Like, I'm not, like, like I'm not in competition with other churches. Like, that's, like we're not competing with one another. Like, we're, hopefully we can complement one another. Everybody maybe have like little like one person does something like this, another person does something like this. That doesn't make this person or that person wrong. It's like that makes us the body of Christ. All of us different. I just want to encourage you, just find a place that you can come together with a body of believers that you can say, I'm gonna be all in. I would rather you be all in a different church than be halfway in this church. Now I'd rather be all in in this church, just to be really honest with you. But I'm just telling you, like, again, I just want to be so clear. We're fine without you. We don't need you. This is about you. This is about your purpose. This is about what God wants to do in you and through you. Test him and see if he won't do the miraculous in your life. This is about you walking in your purpose. And if you don't trust us, that's fine. Just go somewhere where you can trust him. And jump all the way in because you need to walk in your purpose for your future. Let's be a church full of generous people. Heavenly Father, we love you and we're grateful for you. God, I, I thank you for your generosity. I thank you for your example of sending your son to die so we could be free and so we could be forgiven. Father, let us be an example of you to our community, example of generosity. Father, let us be all in with you. God, let us not be, let us not be deceived and think that we're right with you when we are not. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here and you just be really honest today and say, I'm not following the Lord. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get into the semantics. Of once saved, always saved, or backsliding. That doesn't matter right now. It's important, but it doesn't matter right now. What matters right now is you say, I just want to follow God. I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to begin following Jesus, really following him with my whole life. I want to go all in. If that's you all over the room, I'm just going to say a simple prayer with you. If that's you all over the room, you say, I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to begin following Jesus. Will you just slip your hand up in the air so I can pray for you real fast? Thanks. Thanks, amen. Thanks. Thank you, amen. Everybody pray this prayer together with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your generosity in sending him to us. Thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you, to follow you, to worship you every day of my life. Today I'm saved. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for jumping on our YouTube page. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here at Victory Family Church. This is my wife, Christy. Uh, I just want to say welcome to the family. We talk about family a lot here. Now you're a part of the family on YouTube. And so hopefully the content here will help you, challenge you, encourage you, and maybe make you laugh a little bit. So uh, subscribe. We'd love to have you. Uh, have an awesome day.